Good morning, dear ones, and welcome to the Unity of Claremont Sunday Lesson for August the 9th, 2020. This week's lesson is The Barber Bride. This week's biblical bride is probably one of the best known of all the stories in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's set in the time of the Judges, and the Book of Judges is full of interesting stories. To put it in context, Moses led the Hebrew people out of the Promised Land, but died before entering himself. Joshua took over where Moses left off, and Joshua was the first of many leaders who, over the course of the next 200 years, led the people of Yahweh in the conquest of the indigenous Canaanite tribes. Eventually, there were 12 Israelite tribes, and they divided Canaan into 12 geographical areas. The chronicle of these bloody struggles is told in the book of Judges, since the various military leaders were called Judges. At that time, the tribes were not united under a king. Jerusalem was not the capital, and there was, of course, no temple. We are introduced to the circumstances of the story of Samson and Delilah Lila, with these dramatic words. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for forty years. This means that the Israelites, while keeping their land and allowed to have leaders, were like a client state. They paid tribute to the Philistines and were subject to them. But, as we shall see, their dominance over the Israelites was tenuous. Two of the heroes in the time of the judges were Samuel, a prophet, and Samson, who was a judge of his tribe for 20 years. Both of them had miraculous births, and both were considered to be consecrated, dedicated to God by their mothers as Nazarites. A Nazarite was distinguished by never cutting his hair, never drinking wine, and never touching a dead body. In order not to pull out any hair by accident, Nazarites did not comb their hair but wore it in dreadlocks. In return for this dedication, Yahweh gave Samson superhuman strength and made him an incomparable warrior. He's the one who single-handedly killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. However, he didn't use his powers only as a warrior, and he was not above using them for his personal revenge or to show off, or even just for fun, like the time he tore a lion apart with his bare hands. Samson had a strong addiction to foreign women, and he regularly visited Canaanite prostitutes. He had a bad experience with one, and even tried unsuccessfully to marry a Philistine woman before he ran into Delilah, who also lived among the Philistines. Delilah is a Hebrew name meaning delicate. Was she a Hebrew living among the Philistines or a Philistine with a Hebrew name? Actually, while we know the story of Samson and Delilah in great detail, we know absolutely nothing about her. Biblical women are usually identified by their fathers, husbands, or brothers. However, even though we know she lived among the Philistines, we are not specifically told that she was one herself. She appears to be an independent actor answerable to no man. While Samson obviously fell head over heels in love with Delilah, there's no indication in the story that she loved him. In fact, 
We're not specifically told that their relationship was ever consummated. It may not have been. And I base that theory on the assumption that since she was independent, with no father to give her in marriage, and no male relatives with whom to negotiate a bride price, Samson was trying to woo her into marriage. Something that, as we shall see, the men of that time had no idea how to do. She may have been stringing him along, withholding sex until after a marriage she knew never would happen. Or, I may be completely wrong and she was just a prostitute. We will never know. But we do know that the Philistine rulers became aware that Samson was often with her. They came to Delilah and offered her money if she found out what made Samson so strong. A lot of money. So, Delilah went home, made a great meal for Samson, and during dinner asked him what made him so strong. Samson responded that if he was tied up with seven bowstrings, he would lose his strength. Delilah went and told the rulers, who instructed her to tie up Samson in his sleep, which she did, with Philistine soldiers hiding behind a curtain. Then she yelled, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. Apparently a predetermined cue. The soldiers rushed in, Samson woke up, burst through the strings like cobwebs, and the soldiers, seeing that Samson was both free and strong, rushed out again. Delilah feigned anger. You have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you could be bound. Samson told her that he would indeed lose his strength if he were tied up with never used ropes. So, the next time he fell asleep in her house, she had the new rope and soldiers handy and tied him up again. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming, she cried, upon which the soldiers rushed in, only to see to their horror that his superpowers were intact and the ropes broken like threads. So once again, they beat a hasty, a ha a hasty retreat. Undeterred, Delilah played the victim again. Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you could be bound. This time he set her a more daunting challenge. If you weave my hair into a loom, then I shall become weak like anyone else. Undeterred, the next time he slept over, Having hidden a small loom in her bedchamber, she wove his hair while he slept. She then gave the signal, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming. The soldiers rushed in. Samson woke up, instantly destroyed the loom with his superhuman strength, and the soldiers retreated on a now well-worn path. Samson must have been truly blinded by love because he never connected the dots. Or maybe he was just all brawn and no brain, simply unable to figure out that her obvious attempts to weaken him were an indication that she did not love him. Didn't he notice that the Philistine attacks occurred only when she had bound him in his sleep? Apparently not, because after persistent nagging, he finally did tell her the truth. I have been a Nazarite, consecrated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, he explained. Soon thereafter, while he slept with his head in her lap, she cut off his seven locks. Upon hearing the signal, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are coming, the soldiers rushed in, 
Samson's strength was gone, he was taken captive, and his eyes gouged out. We're not told what happened to Delilah after this. Apparently, she was paid the agreed-upon fee by the Philistine rulers and continued her independent life in comfort. Yahweh did not punish her. Even though Samson explained to her that he was consecrated to God. My guess is that the mentality of the biblical writers of the time was that women were morally weak and, without proper supervision, could not be expected to act with integrity. In fact, until very recently in our own time, women were referred to as the weaker sex. It was never a comment about muscle strength. This famous story, as you probably know, has a very dramatic ending. Several Hollywood movies have been made based on it. As a captive, his hair grew long again, and he repented of his ways. He had broken the laws of Moses by consorting with foreign women and used his powers selfishly. In the end, he prayed to Yahweh to be allowed to use his superhuman strength one last time. Chained to the pillars of the temple of the Philistine god Dagon, he toppled the pillars, the temple collapsed, and over 3,000 Philistines, including their rulers and their wives, were crushed to death along with Samson. As with other Hebrew stories, this one was not written during the time of the judges when it supposedly took place, but hundreds of years later. The issue of marriage between Hebrews and foreigners was a persistent one. The prophets railed against it, the kings periodically enforced the Mosaic law to the letter, but the practice was never completely eradicated. In fact, we have already studied two foreign brides in this series, Ruth and Tamar, who are revered and given places of honor in Hebrew history. But both Ruth and Tamar respected Hebrew traditions. Apparently, because it was so prevalent, marriage to foreign women was tolerated where the women converted. So, to the people for whom this story was written, the messages were clear. Number one, it is wrong to marry or consort with foreign women. Number two, although prostitution is legal, foreign prostitutes are dangerous. Number three, independent women with no male to keep them in line are evil. That was then, this is now. What is the spiritual value for us some 3,000 years later? If we are to understand this story, we must realize that it is not a historical incident, but a story that helps us understand something that goes on within our own consciousness. The Philistines are within in us. The Israelites are within us. Samson is within us. Delilah is within us. They represent thoughts, feelings, beliefs, attitudes, habits, and practices that are very active in our own consciousness. In metaphysical terms, this story is a statement of the principle of cause and effect. Obedience to spirit, the indwelling principle of being, brings forth blessings. Disregarding inner guidance leads to unpleasant and undesirable consequences. Although the book of Judges, th throughout the book of Judges, when the people repented, the Lord would send a deliverer. In this instance, it was supposed to be Samson. Samson was not the noble character he should have been, but 
he got the job done for a time. Charles Fillmore tells us in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary that the Philistines represent the world, the world of appearances. They represent the many thoughts, feelings, and beliefs we let rule and persuade us that are based on appearances. When we make decisions based on facts rather than intuition, we are letting the Philistines rule us. When we look at the challenges or conditions before us and think of them as impossible, hard, difficult, we are letting the Philistines rule us. When we judge by appearances, other people's negative opinions, when we get very passionately persuaded by the beauty or sensuousness of appearances, we are letting the Philistines dominate us. When we seek a job because it may, be, may seem to offer fame and fortune, we're under the influence of Philistine persuasion. When we seek a relationship with a person because of physical attractiveness alone, we are under the influence of the Philistines. We do many things because of the potential pleasure that these outer things seem to offer us. Delilah represents the pleasure of the senses expressed as overindulgence. There's nothing bad or evil about sensory experience. It's only when we let our senses control us that the, to the extent that we do not follow our higher, better sense of judgment or intelligence from spirit within us. This is not just a story to point out the evils of sex, as so many would interpret it. Sex is not evil. It was thought to be evil in some religious traditions. This story is talking about all sensory habits and practices, the ones that ensnare and trap us and keep us in bondage. We all know how challenging and difficult it is to overcome sensory habits, habits of drinking, smoking, drugs, overeating, overindulgence in sensory pursuits, that lead to physical, mental, and psychological problems. Samson got to the place where he could not even think clearly. You would think he could recognize that Deli what Delilah was up to. You would think that he could realize sometimes what certain sensory experiences would lead to. The bondage and misery, for example, of taking drugs. Samson lost not only his strength, but he lost the most important thing of all. He lost that feeling of oneness with his indwelling Lord, the source of all his strength. We're also told that his eyes were put out. This means a loss of spiritual perception. He may have been a Nazarite dedicated to God, but he was still subject to the laws of the universe. He had no special privileges. Sometimes individuals get the notion that being in religious or charitable work gives them special privileges. But no one is exempt. No one gets special dispensations. We all must seek to understand and apply principle in our lives. Another way of saying this is we must be obedient to the Lord. After all, obedience brings blessings, great blessings of peace of mind, health, supply, and security. The loss of spiritual perception includes a loss of the feeling of oneness, the sense of aloneness, and this breeds feelings of guilt. Sometimes an individual will become so obsessed with the pursuit of some physical, sensual goal that he loses all common sense. Many sensory pursuits may seem harmless in the beginning, but turn out to be our undoing. There are many other sensory pursuits that seem harmless and yet may have negative consequences later on. Remember 
It's the uncontrollable pursuit of sensory indulgence that must be brought into obedience to the Lord. Your inner spirit will tell you what you need to do. We need to take time out of our pursuit of pleasurable sensory seeking to seek spiritual understanding. There are many Delilahs that would capture our attention, such as radio, TV, rock concerts, symphonies, video games, computers, football, and baseball. There's nothing wrong with any of these, but when it comes becomes possessive, the individual is asking for problems. The loss of hair symbolizes the loss of vitality energy and strength that goes along with excessive overindulgence in sensory pursuits. We should seek to develop the spiritual side of our nature and when we can and then we can enjoy the sensory side of life without being a source of bondage and misery. There's great joy and happiness to a feeling of self-worth when we know that through the power of the indwelling spirit, we are in control of our lives. Yet another metaphysical interpretation presents itself in the story of Samson and Delilah. Male characters in scripture represent the thinking, decision-making, and logical aspect of your being, while the female characters represent the feeling and intuitive side. Have you ever been in a state where you felt one way, you thought another way, and you hated the way you felt, or you hated the way you were thinking? You see, this is the dilemma. This is one of those cul-de-sacs that can get us into any inner working of soul. And because your thinking hates the way you're feeling, the male is at odds against the female in you. Or it could be the other way around. You're feeling one way and you're having to think and talk in another way. And you hate the way you're thinking and talking. You're feeling nature hates it. Then the female is at odds with the male. If it happens either way, what happens to you? What happens to your organism in the middle of all this? There's a serious leakage of vital vitality of vital energy. It's a serious leakage. When we get back into alignment with principle, with spirit, the leaks are repaired. The hair grows back. The vitality is restored and things go well. So let's end today's talk with this affirmation taken from our five basic principles. I know the truth, and I live the truth I know. Amen. So be it. And so it is. So, thank you for listening. If you would like to support Unity of Claremont, you can send your donation to our post office box, 641 Mineola, Florida, 34755. Until we meet again. This is Nancy Willingham wishing you a happy, healthy, prosperous, and meaningful week. Many blessings.